Okay. So this is an I'd like to call to order the Tuesday, May 8th meeting of the Dinah Park and Recreation Commission. Janet, could you give us a roll call, please? Yep. Commissioner McCauley? Here. Commissioner Eitz? Here. Commissioner Willett? Here. Commissioner Darlene? Here. Commissioner Good? Here. Commissioner McCormick? Here. Commissioner Burke? Here. Commissioner Keeley? Here. Commissioner Shepard? Here. Thank you, Janet. I'd like to also call to your attention, you should have an updated agenda in front of you, and that's the agenda we will be using tonight. We made a couple changes on it from the first one that went out in the electronic packet. So if I could have a motion to uh, approve our meeting agenda for the evening. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. That's passed. And then approval of our meeting minutes for our meeting of April 10th, 2018. Could I have a motion to approve? Seconded. Any comments on the meeting agenda minutes from April? Anyone have any changes, issues with it? Everything looked okay? If that's the case, can we uh, have a vote on the meeting minutes from April uh, 10th? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay, that passed. Community comment. Any community comments this evening? Okay, seeing none, we will move to reports and recommendations. So first up for the evening, uh, Arden Park 60% design check-in. And Ann, I'll turn it over to you and Renee to kick that one off. We had our open house here tonight out front and another one that was Saturday morning at Arden Park. So lots of opportunity to get some insights from the community as well. So thanks for being here, Renee. Thank you very much, Chair Good and members of the Commission. Uh, we have before you this evening a 60% promise update uh, for the Arden Park project. Uh, the last time we reported back to you was in uh, January uh, with the entire plan. Uh, we have this report back uh, and then we will be reporting back again at the 90% phase um, in August, I believe. Uh, we talked at last month about, uh, well, we actually last month we had two different items. We had a joint work session with the City Council and then uh, the Parks and Rec Commission made a recommendation about ash trees as part of the park project. So just a couple of other uh, recaps. Uh, we talked about the design, we talked about ash trees, we talked about the Brookview sidewalk uh, that was recommended. And uh, we also talked about some ADA improvements that we could be making throughout the design of the park. So just a few things that we want to talk to you about tonight. We want to continue to talk about uh, the project and the, uh, the, um, the extent that we have, have come to with the design at the 60% phase. We'll talk a little bit about the design goals. We, as we continue to go throughout this entire project, we're always referring back to the original design goals that we promised to the residents, the Parks and Rec Commission, and the City Council. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, specific park elements that have been uh, further modified since the last time you saw it. So again, uh, referring back to some of those design goals, we talked, we had another uh, open house this evening and we talked to a lot of residents about how we are really listening to the comments that we've been hearing throughout this entire process and how uh, we feel that we've been responding and the response really has been uh, very supportive from our residents so far. 
Uh, one thing we said we were going to do was maintain the rustic character of the park. We were going to improve the public experience throughout. Uh, we want to increase fishing and in-stream recreational opportunities. We want to improve the access both visually and physically to the creek. We want to update aging park facilities. We want to increase public safety. We want to improve the biological and geological function and the value of the creek and the surrounding corridor. And we want to improve regional stormwater management. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Renee. Renee and I are gonna do a little bit of a tag team this evening. Thanks, Ann. Before you is a sketch drawing of the concept plan for Arden Park. Um, you'll notice the sort of different shadings of green indicating the woodlands, the lighter green uh, wetland and floodplain area with the stream um, in its newly proposed alignment coming through the park. The dam comes out at West 54th and um, then there's some bit of bank stabilization just downstream. This plan also shows um, new trail alignments, the green space, and trail connections up to Brookview. We'll go through all these separate elements of creek, trails, stormwater in more detail as we go through the plan. Here's a close up just to show um, a little bit more of the changes for the park. You can see below the shading the line work for the proposed changes. You'll see the trail alignments, the crossing to the north, the existing playground area, which will be replaced. The light green indicates stormwater features above ground, depressional areas that are planted within the park to treat stormwater. And this plan does a good job of showing the changes with respect to existing conditions. You'll see a red box indicating the location of the current shelter building and a red um, uh, pair of lines indicating the location of the existing bridge today. And then the new line work shows a, newly, a new bridge with the new stream alignment and trail coming up next to the ice rink, which is unchanged. First, the stream corridor. The stream is about 2,000 feet in length for restoration, and that's starting from 54th going just to the north of the existing play structure. The creek gets about 150 feet longer in this design. The little black boxes show different types of creek access points. Access for fishing and then physical access in three locations for getting in and out of the creek. As part of design development moving forward, we'll decide on the size and aesthetic design of each of those accesses, which one or ones are best to be larger for canoe, which ones are smaller for just getting out with a tube or kayak. The picture on the right depicts pools and riffles, and that's what we talked about in stream language throughout the concept phase and about the changes in the creek. Taking out the dam changes the creek from a ponded backwater wetland lake type of system to a flowing creek system of pools and riffles, which support the different types of biology that make the creek system healthy. And the picture on the right shows pools and riffles. Another change that we wanted to highlight as part of 60% is under the West 54th Street Bridge. Important throughout design is preservation of the fishing hole and experience downstream of West 54th Street Bridge. We looked at if we change how water works under the bridge, how does the fishing hole get affected? And through the um, engineering work, which we presented as part of the public open houses, the flow conditions that cause the fishing hole to occur today will still occur after the project. The change under the bridge is part of that concrete slab underneath the bridge gets cut out and then a low flow channel that's depicted on the bottom is in place. It's about 12 feet wide 
boulders lining the bottom of it. This will allow for a bit of a deeper flow in low flow times. Trees has been discussed since 30% design and at our previous check-ins. Ash tree management is of concern as well as overall tree impacts as part of the project. Early in um, concept phase, we had a pretty high estimate of tree impacts that we said we would look more carefully at during the early phases of project design to optimize creek alignment and its ecological benefits while preserving trees. And here we're showing we did that. We also highlight the number of ash trees in Arden Park and the number of ash trees impacted versus total ash trees. And overall ash tree management we are, and Parks has approved, recommended approval for managing all the ash trees in Arden Park. How we're going to do that will be part of the natural area management plan with the buckthorn and the other natural areas management, um, where it makes sense to go in and get ash trees during construction. We'll do that where it makes sense to phase with buckthorn removal to not destabilize steep slopes. We'll consider that where ash trees are easily accessible, we'll consider that. But um, we uh, have heard the um, recommendation to include overall ash tree management as part of the design. Stormwater management is another big element of the park. The primary, primary source of stormwater comes from the north and east basically an 80 acre drainage area that goes up to the intersection of 50th and France. It comes in through a couple of large drainage pipes that discharge directly to the creek untreated today, shown by the green arrow at the top of the, top of the plan. Stormwater will be treated in kind of a phased approach. There'll be underground structures, large manholes and concrete boxes to clean stormwater as it comes in. Stormwater will then be diverted into two paths around the edges of the park into above ground swales or depressed areas which are planted similar looking to the image on the right and here's another image of what that might look like. Those are design details to be developed um, as we move forward out of 60 but that's the scheme for managing stormwater within the park. Before you is a trails map, the, uh, another large improvement of the park there are um, considerations for accessibility. The green line going across the park is ADA accessible and considered the primary arterial trail through the park, which will be plowed in the winter. The stars indicate locations of two bridges, the northern top star being a new bridge with the aesthetic shown in the picture. Both bridges um, will have that slight camber or arch with a wood deck, a steel truss structure, and steel railings with a wood beam. At the north, cutting through the lowland forest to get up to Brookview will be boardwalk, uh, example photo shown, and then steps similar to the existing wood steps by the ice rink to get the rest of the way up to the Brookview Trail. The um, nature trail is what we're calling it along Minnehaha Boulevard will be crushed rock and a secondary user experience in kind of the floodplain forest area from between the West 54th Street Bridge to the main active use area in the park. This area, if you look today, is, sits much lower than the street and existing sidewalk. Today it's flooded. The changes with the project by removing the dam will result in a drier area here. It'll still be considered wetland and floodplain and still be wet sometime, um, not as much as it is today. So this um, secondary user experience is what we're calling a nature trail. Thank you, Renee. Uh, we have a 
group that has been working on the park shelter building now for approximately the last month. I'd like to thank Eileen, Rick, Corin, and Julie, who have been participating in these meetings. We'll have our third meeting uh, this Wednesday of this week. We also have eight resident members that are participating in this uh, design process and uh, several staff members as well. The first thing that the, uh, the group did was talk about the orientation of the building in the park. Uh, it's interesting in when we have done the rest of our park shelter buildings, it's really pretty clear the orientation of the building in the park. This one is challenging because honestly, you could have four different uh, really popular views from that shelter building. Um, so pretty much the first meeting was uh, taken up by figuring out the orientation of the building uh, in the park itself. Uh, once, we t once we decided that, uh, we started to talk more about the size of the building, the elements des de desired in the, in the building, and that type of thing. Uh, to give you an idea of the orientation, um, let me go back, oops, uh, this one shows it actually. Um, the group decided to orient the building in a north-south orientation. It gives the ability to have views from inside the building to the playground, it gives views to the open skate area, and it gives beautiful views down the creek. Um, so I think that's a really great uh, orientation of the building. And then we started to get into discussions about things like the size of the building, the restrooms, um, the number of restrooms, um, the size of the mechanical room, inside space versus outside space, and all of those types of things. And that's pretty much where we are right now. Uh, we have in this diagram four different sizes of buildings with really very much the same types of amenities. Um, option E3 shows just two restrooms as opposed to four restrooms. Uh, one thing that we heard very clearly from the members of the design group and from the residents is that they were very interested in gender neutral restrooms. Um, so in this case, a design would look something like if we look at E4, there would be access to one restroom from the outside and there would be access to one restroom from the inside of the building. Um, the group also talked a lot about wanting a very significant outdoor uh, space. And so we talked about overhangs, we talked about shade, we talked about views. And so what you see in every single one of these designs is an outline of what could be a roof line to have an overhang structure, and these are picnic tables underneath the overhang. So they all really have similar square footages, although that is a very significant um, difference that will need to be decided. Um, and they have similar types of elements um, in the building. This is a little bit hard to see on this PowerPoint presentation, but this is one of the design boards that we showed at uh, both open houses. And what we were trying to depict to the residents in, um, in this board is showing three photos of what the Pamela Park shelter building looks like currently what the countryside building looks like currently, and then down in the lower left-hand corner is Weber Park. Uh, what you probably can't read up in the upper left-hand corner is the square footages of those buildings, both inside and outside. We wanted to show for comparison's sake uh, the square footages of those buildings. Uh, we solicited feedback from the residents on different types of roof uh, finishings. So we've got shingles, we've got cedar, and we've got uh, a metal roof, and we also showed a green roof uh, structure. And then we also solicited feedback from residents on siding. Uh, we have a hardy board siding and a cedar siding option. And then also talked about uh, a rock-faced lower, maybe three feet of the building. We've added that on all of the newer shelter buildings that we've done. It adds a really nice look but it also significantly helps with maintenance because you don't have snow, 
Um, you don't have rain that's um, you know up against the bottom of the building. It helps with vandalism, and it really does give a nice look if you if you look at the the photo of the the Pamela building is a really nice example. Um, in the bottom center, uh, those are just some very preliminary design options. You know what uh, some of these different layouts of the buildings could look like. Uh, we'd be happy to take any feedback from the commission this evening. Um, I can tell you a little bit um, that I think one of the most consistent things that I heard from residents throughout the process is overwhelmingly people like the design of the Pamela Park building with the shed roof. Um, I, I honestly can't think of anyone who, throughout the hundreds of people that I saw, liked one of the other designs better than the shed roof at Pamela. So that was really interestingly um, conclusive uh, about the design and the roof structure of that building. Um, lots of comments about shingles in terms of cost, in terms of look. A little bit of interest in cedar, but there was also a lot of people that didn't think cedar was a good idea at all. And there was also a fair amount of interest in a, in a metal roof option. A few residents had interest in a green roof, but the majority honestly did not, and they were concerned about the long-term maintenance and the cost for installation. So I think uh, the feedback was pretty, uh, pretty mixed between the metal roof and the shingle roof. Um, in terms of the size of the building, I think we heard pretty loud and clear from residents that they're not interested in the size of a building like Pamela. The park isn't as big as Pamela, um, but um, definitely something big enough to be able to handle a couple of hockey teams, I would say. Um, from what I heard, at least an occupancy of 50 people uh, inside the building. Um, I think more people liked the square layout as opposed to the long and uh, more narrow layout of the building. Um, the building up on the, on the top center is very similar to what you see at Pamela right now. Uh, at Pamela, we did have some constraints of how we could build that building because on the north side, we had the well building, and then on the south side, we had the batting cages. We had to have the restrooms a certain number of feet from the wellhead, and so we were, we were in a very tightly constrained space. Um, the nice thing about a more square building, if you look at something as simple as windows, if you think about Pamela, how we have this big, nice open area uh, that is facing the east at Pamela, um, this is a view, the, the third picture down is from the inside. You see a, a lot of really natural light coming in. The square building gives the opportunity to have more windows on both the north and the south side than the rectangular version would have. Um, also gives a little bit of an easier space to use for a group of 50 if there is a party or if there is some sort of a neighborhood association meeting. Uh, so I, I think I personally heard more, and I look forward to reading the comments from tonight's meeting, but I seem to hear more, and I'd be uh, interested in hearing Eileen and Rick, uh, the feedback that they heard um, on the shelter building as well. Okay, Rick or Eileen, do you want to yeah, add sure. something first? Um, Thanks. I thought the uh, event on Saturday, very positive feedback um, from most of the residents. Um, size of the building I, I thought people were ending up in the uh, the one that was 1750 square feet a little bit um, because of the uh, the need for a room for hockey teams and hockey bags and um, a lot of people seemed interested in it being a community gathering space um, and then that would um, accommodate the bathrooms I think too that size if I'm correct on that um, and they were all, it, the unisex bathrooms big interest in that um, the north and south outside seating design um, uh, it was preferred. Um, as far as the trees, um, because I think a lot of people were aware of the Ashboro now any Dinah, um, when it kind of talked to them about if we do it now, we can replace the trees. If the Ashboro spreads throughout the city, we have to divide that up. And then everybody was like, oh, yeah, replace them. 
know. So they seem to get it that it's, if you do it now, it saves money from the construction point of view, but they want to make sure they get replacement trees, so that seemed to spur them a little bit there. Um, most people were very, very positive on it, on the, the, the creek being more usable. Um, there was some concern of, of looking at a building from some people across the street, but the building they're looking at now is not very attractive either, I think. And the design of the Pamela Park roof, everybody was like, wow, that's really nice. Um, so I, I, I thought it was a very positive meeting um, from the residents' points of view. A lot of people were in the playground, came over and looked at the rest of the pictures, commented on the playground area. I didn't get over there too much, so I don't know if you did, but um, that's the comments that I heard. I agree with Eileen. Um, the thing that I heard tonight uh, from this, uh, from the few people that were here, is uh, the size of the occupancy capabilities. Um, because the lack of parking at this park, um, you know, if we go to a larger occupancy type building, um, 40, 50 kids playing hockey, there are not all neighborhood kids. Um, where are we going to park them? I think is a big concern. Um, light, light was important both Saturday and tonight. Um, and I think the square, as you said, the square size building certainly uh, gives us that. But uh, occupancy question was the one tonight. Though. Okay, thanks, Eileen. Thanks, Rick. Questions, inputs from other commissioners? For I, Renee do, I do have a little bit more of the presentation. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I apologize, you. Greg. It's all right. Uh, we are almost done. Uh, we promised to report back at the 60% design phase um, a budget update, and we have a, a very high-level budget update for you this evening. Uh, the concept cost estimate came in at just over $2.3 million, and at the 60% phase, we are slightly above that at uh, just under $2.5 million. Uh, there are a lot of different categories and different classifications that go into that. Some of the numbers went up, some of the numbers went down, um, and we still have more changes to go. Uh, we just wanted to touch base um, as a design team. We wanted to touch base with the commission. We wanted to certainly touch base with the city council and the watershed district uh, to make sure that we weren't uh, designing something that we weren't going to be able to afford to build. Um, as we continue down the design phase, these numbers will continue to change, uh, but we just wanted to show you this evening that, uh, that we are uh, we are close. Uh, these numbers will continue to, uh, to flux over the next few months. And on the facilities number on that sheet, is that the building then, like mostly the building? Um, under facilities, we have the shelter building, we have the playground, we have the, uh, the hockey rink and lights. Okay, so which uh, size building was... In, in these numbers that were? That was based on just a flat budget estimate, and that was actually one of the significant changes in the budget. Um, before we started this project was before I hired an architect and looked really further into the cost estimating for today's dollars, and I used a budget that I used from Pamela Park two years ago. Um, and I had a budget estimate of $650,000 in that line item. When I started um, interviewing architects for the design of this building, I gave them a 2,500 square foot building. And the first thing that I heard from the two companies that I talked to was, you don't have nearly enough of a budget. And I actually asked one of the architecture firms, not the one that we used actually, but another architecture firm, if they would do a deep dive into the Pamela building and look at costs um, in 2014 for the construction of that building versus today's dollars. And um, that, that building would have cost $800,000 in today's dollars to build that building. So it was suggested to me that we increase our uh, building budget. So you're not seeing that number um, reflected specifically in this high level budget, but we did increase the budget estimate for the shelter building to $800,000 from 650. And are they giving you a per square foot charge at all? I mean, what they're charging per square foot to build the building? And my question is really about, does it matter? I mean, if we reduce the size of the building, 
200 square feet or increase it 200 square feet, is that really going to dramatically change the cost? Um, there isn't a quick and easy answer to that because there are so many factors that go into it, but they certainly can give a, a basic square foot. So typically what I tell an architect when I'm starting to design these buildings is I tell them, most of them have been inside Edina City Hall, I tell them to consider the finishes that you see in Edina City Hall. We consider this to be a very nice building. Um, it's a building that's gonna last a very long time, but it's certainly not high, high-end finishes, but it's definitely not low-end finishes as well. So, you know, the architects kind of talking in those terms will say, oh yeah, that's so many dollars per square foot. So certainly there will be some changes if we change the building square footage, um, you know, 200 to 500 square feet. Uh, but there are some costs that you're not gonna see a significant change. We need to sprinkle that building, whether it's 2,500 square feet or whether it's 2,000 square feet. So the, the incremental change isn't going to be that much. Um, if we have a trade-off between more exterior space and a little smaller interior space. There's certainly gonna be a trade-off on dollars. It's a lot less expensive to build an overhang than it is finished inside square footage, but you still need the same HVAC system. It's still gonna cost the same amount of money to bring the fiber to the building. There are just certain costs that are fixed. So until we actually bid the project, um, it's gonna be hard to know exactly, but I will be hiring um, not sure if it's going to be an architecture firm or a, a, a construction manager once we have uh, the details of the building design and I will ask them to do a more detailed cost estimate um, to maybe give us an opportunity to, to do some trade-offs or some different options for the building and also just to make sure that, again, we're designing a building that we're going to be able to afford to build so we can make some changes prior to putting the project out for bid as opposed to afterwards. So with that, the next steps that we have is we're going to be making almost the identical presentation to the City Council next week. Uh, we'll be asking the City Council to move forward to the 90% phase. Uh, we have given the City Council and the Watershed District this opportunity for a check-in to give the go or no go on the project. Do they want us to continue to move forward to the 90% phase um, or not? So we're gonna be asking for the permission to continue to move forward to the 90% phase. Uh, we're going to be asking them to authorize uh, publishing an environmental impact statement. And then we're also going to be uh, soliciting feedback from them as we did you last month on ash tree removal. So that'll be uh, the main content of our meeting next week. And we'll be having a same, similar conversation with the uh, Minnehaha Creek Watershed District Board of Managers on May 24th. So with that, we would be happy to answer any questions or take any comments. Good, thank you. Two important additions. Questions, inputs? I got a couple. Um, one was about picnic tables. I'm assuming that those would be followed the same that we do for the, like the gazebo at Lake Cornelia. I'm sure, is there permitting that's required? And keep me honest, is there is that a possible revenue source or is it just you request it and you can get permits if you go through it it's just a it's a it's something that's just available to the residents the um the, the gazebo at pamela or at rosland is our largest outdoor gazebo so if you want to reserve that we do have a fee to reserve that structure at a facility like we would have at arden those would not be reservable on the outside. They would just be open to the public. Um, if you want to reserve the building inside, I suppose we could talk about if we wanted to have an option of reserving both the inside and the outside of the building. This would be, uh, we do have this um, type of a situation at Countryside, actually, where we have an outdoor area. We don't specifically reserve that outdoor space, but it would be something that we could consider as part of an inside rental. I don't think we would just rent the tables underneath the overhang um, as a separate rental. Got it. And then the other piece to the shelter, um, and I heard from the residents, they're talking about Arden being used by hockey teams. 
both adult and youth, I assume. And looking at some of the usage, Arden Park is one of our largest skating areas or one of the top five of the 12 ranks. So um, my question is, is that with the shelter building place where it is, are we, did we account for potentially having to put like rubber mats on that bridge so that kids in skates or skaters that are walking over that with the wood timbers aren't, you know, chopping that thing up? Or do we look at other potential placements for the shelter building, i.e. that other little nook that's next to the, to the rink if, if the split of the skaters that's coming to Arden is more hockey players versus people using the open skate. So I just wanted to see if you guys accounted for that. Absolutely, Matt. Thank you. We did have very significant conversations about accommodating both open skaters and hockey skaters uh, with the new shelter building. We also included our park maintenance division and the staff specifically that have maintained uh, that facility for the last many, many years, uh, probably 25 years actually. Um, one thing that I think is really important to note is that we're not planning on a change in the use of Arden Park for skating or for hockey. It is, as Matt said, one of our most popular skating facilities. It's one of our most popular hockey facilities for people of all ages, which is really fun. Um, with new facilities, um, certainly that is not going to change. Um, it will be a very, very popular um, hockey facility. Um, it is used very heavily right now, even with the old shelter building. So I think it's important to note that while there will be possibly two hockey teams that are going to be playing at that arena with possibly increased traffic, it's really what there is there currently today. Um, we're not expecting to have more teams playing there. It will be uh, very similar uh, use to what you see at the park right now. Um, we do currently have rubber mats that we put down over that bridge and we would do the same thing. We also currently uh, flood in a path to get to those rubber mats. So this path would be slightly longer um, but our staff doesn't see that as being any bit of a problem, and it sounds like it's actually kind of a popular amenity for the kids and for the adults that use that park. I did just have uh, one quick question about the uh, gender neutral, neutral bathrooms. So with the conversation in that, was it more of like a, did people say they wanted that as a third option, or was it like just all of the bathrooms that were gonna be gender neutral? if they're all, I mean, it looked like they were all single use, so was it more like just all of them were gonna be unisex, gender neutral, or was it more of a third option type thing? Yes, um, what was discussed and what we have heard again across the board from everyone is all gender neutral restrooms. So all four would be, uh, would be gender neutral. Sure, yeah. that would make the most sense to me. I'm sure there's plenty to disagree, but that would definitely make the most sense to me, considering they're all single use anyway. Great, thank you. Sorry, just on the bathroom front, the ones that are in the proposals for the shelters that have doors to the outside, are those expected to be open nine to nine or some sort of, so even if there isn't an attendant or, you know, like let's say it's summer months and stuff like that, what's the expectation on, on those and what does that mean to your guys' maintenance? One of the beauties of the new shelter buildings is we do have a fairly significant added expense actually, but we run fiber to the new buildings. It gives us the ability to have Wi-Fi at the buildings. It also uh, allows us to get connected to the city's network, which allows us to put in a keyless entry system to those buildings. So all of the new shelter buildings that you see um, have keyless entry systems, so we're able to program the use the locking and unlocking of those buildings from City Hall, um, which gives us the ability to every single day of the year set that specific program that we want those buildings to be locked and unlocked. Honestly, right now, um, that shelter building does not have a keyless entry system. It needs to be manually locked and unlocked. And a decision was made because we do not have the staff to come through the entire park system every single day to lock and unlock those doors. A decision was made in those older shelter buildings to unlock them at the beginning of the season and lock them up at the end of the season again so those restrooms stay open 24 seven. So this would give us the ability to be able to control that and lock those buildings at night. 
Anyone else? I've got a couple. Going back to the uh, discussion on winter maintenance, uh, Renee, I think you mentioned the main thoroughfare is intended to be the, the path running from the northeast to the southwest. And Anne, this probably falls upon our responsibility. What's the thought about the new bridge to the north? Is that going to be kept clear during the winter, or will we close that off in the winter? What do you think the expectation for that would be? Well, the bridge up here in the yes. circle? Yes. That definitely, that trail would not be maintained during the winter. Okay. Yeah, the nature trails would not be maintained. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, I've heard a couple times uh, questions on uh, just issues of safety. It came up certainly when we talked about uh, the sidewalk um, and maybe some uh, trail lighting. Has that been a, a topic of any more discussion or any more thoughts around any other safety features or safety concerns that have come up as we've gone through to the design phase? I've had some conversations with some residents about their interest in lighting to be considered safety and security lighting with um, the sensitivity to make sure that the lights are bright enough to provide a safety element, but definitely not too bright to impact homes on either side of the park. Um, have had many conversations with residents about um, activity going on in the park at night that requires calls to the police. And um, so they are very excited actually about having this renovation project, having a little bit more formalized trails on both the north and the south side of the park that might get more uh, walkers through there that might deter some of that activity. So, um, so definitely um, some conversations on, on both sides um, of the lighting and just general use of the park that could help the safety and security elements. Okay, all right, good, thank you. Um, the last input that I'd have is I know when we talked last meeting about already thinking about starting a communication plan for a number of the things that will happen, especially the issue and interest around tree removal. And just as I even read through our proposal here at 60%, the one suggestion I've had, I would have is we need to get very, very crisp on how we're going to communicate what we've decided on trees. And I understand what we have right now. We talk about, well, this was the concept plan, and then we went to this, and now we've moved to this. And, and even I kind of got lost a little bit as I was reading through uh, how many trees are we taking out and for what reason and how. So that would just be one input as we think about communicating, is just be very crisp on what we've decided and why and how we plan to address it. Absolutely, and if I could just comment on that briefly. One thing that I think it's really important to note um, and something that I know that we as staff have really struggled with is the amount of feedback and the amount of input that we're receiving throughout this phase has created a lot of give and take and a mm -hmm. lot of change. Yep. So this is very much uh, a document that is a work in progress. And uh, to your point, uh, what we intend to do once we receive direction from the city council, because we haven't received that yet, hopefully we will receive direction from the city council um, next week um, in one way, shape, or form, is we will be working very closely with the watershed district on a management plan. And we will be very specific about our recommendation of when trees come out, when buckthorn comes out, as Renee was mentioning earlier tonight. We want to make sure that um, everything that we do in terms of the native and natural environment, its removal and its replacement is done very thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we will be doing a very detailed management plan and that will be very clearly spelled out. Um, and I think it will be something that the commission, the council, and the residents will find very helpful uh, to understand expectations. Good. Thanks. Sorry, piggybacking on communication, I saw that we may have solved for the original, we'll call it uproar of this project so many months ago, which was the 54th bridge and the fishing hole. What have you, did you guys get anything positive feedback based off of what you presented and being that we found a solution that seems to mitigate for both the people that wanted to enjoy the sounds of that area and keeping that running water type thing and as well as the, as the youth that are currently fishing there? The feedback generally that we have received at every open house um, that we've had has been very supportive. 
Not to say that there aren't residents that are still not concerned about losing the dam or concerned about what the fishing hole might be like, or um, we had literally a handful of residents at the open house at the park on Saturday that were concerned about what that building was gonna look like across the street from their house. So there are certainly um, still some people that are expressing really significant concerns over particular components of the plan, but honestly, um, I'll let Renee chime in um, as well, and I, Eileen and Rick, I would love to hear your feedback as well. I have been very, very pleasantly surprised um, and um, feeling really good about the interaction that we've had with residents and the number of comments from people who have uh, very consciously said thank you. Uh, we, we see that you're listening and responding. I would agree with that. Um, I think I had one person say something about the waterfall. Um, and this was a person who just didn't want a building in the park at all. So, I mean, you just have to you know, take it all in. But one person out of everybody that was there Saturday, I didn't hear one word about it otherwise. So I, I think um, in the beginning, you know, my feeling was that most of the people on the northeast side of the neighborhood wanted it done because they were on the half of the creek that didn't look so great. I think Mike Miller said it once, you turn around and look north and it's a swamp. So um, I think they're very happy with the changes and um, you know, I was surprised that we didn't hear more about, about the meeting Saturday. Good. Pleasantly. Good. Well, clearly a lot of work, as you said, and a lot of inputs uh, and, and some reflection and some changes, which I think are positive. So we look forward to continued efforts and seeing the 90% plan and what kind of feedback you get in your next couple meetings this month. But uh, thank you, Renee, and thank you, Ann, for the updates. Thank you very much. Thank yep. you. Okay, next on our agenda. Uh, I have something up for our consideration around our uh, Edina Parks and Recreations Department vision statement. Our vision statement was included in our 2015 strategic plan. And just to give you a little background on this, when, um, when I presented to the Planning Commission last month for our comprehensive review, uh, and Ann and Rick and I were all in that meeting, I, we had two very direct and distinct comments around our vision statement, which frankly was included as a bit of a preamble almost of kind of giving some grounding of, of where we're coming from before we get to the comprehensive plan. But the feedback was around our selection back in 2015 of, uh, of the word premier and what that reflected both about Edina and maybe even outside of Edina about what we felt about ourselves. And, and also if you think about it, what does it mean to, to achieve premier and then maintain premier? Right, being seen often as people saying, oh, well, you, you, are, you Edina folks, you just have to be the best, better than anybody else. And so their input was to say, you know, a couple other commissions as they're defining themselves and their vision, they're, they're leaning more towards talking about excellence and still maintaining a standard of excellence. So I, I took that input from, again, it came from a couple sources from the Planning Commission and thought, well, what might that look like? And just wanted to offer up for our consideration tonight if we were to take that input and make a change to our vision statement, what uh, what such a vision statement might look like. So what I've got in front of us, and I will just read it into the record here at this point for us to consider, uh, would be to say the vision of the Edina Parks and Rec Recreation Department is to strive for excellence in our parks, recreation, and trail systems, to provide Edina a high quality of life by nurturing the health and well-being of our people, our community, our environment, and our economy. So that would be the vision statement. And then it goes further to say, in fulfillment of that vision, the Dinah Parks and Recs Department mission statement is to create parks, facilities, and programs to foster a healthy, inclusive community. We accomplish this through creative leadership, collaborations, environmentally sustainable practices, and the responsible use of available resources. So no change to the mission statement itself about how we do it but a suggestion, alteration of our vision statement about what we want to be and what we want to become that just does a bit of a trade out for premier into excellence. And the reason why personally as I thought about that is I did think about where we want to go as far as 
benchmarking uh, and continuing to, to manage ourselves around how will we strive to reach our vision. And while excellence is still comparative, uh, it could be aligned to various standards and could accept that others are also excellent. And we're not trying to promote ourselves as saying, you know, we're the best, we're premier, we're better than anybody else. So I wanted to, to provide that feedback and offer this up to the rest of the commission for thoughts, inputs, and see if it was something we thought was, uh, was valuable. Greg, I, I, I like the change. I think it um, is something that you can continue to strive for, and excellence can mean something different as new ideas and innovations come out, and so it kind of keeps you relevant. So. I think it's a positive change. I think the change is fine. If it solves an issue, it's fine. Anyone have a reaction against it that thinks we should stay with a defining of Premier? Initially, I did. But then when you substituted for excellence, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, hearing all that, I will then put this into a motion. Uh, if we would be willing to accept uh, the motion of a change to our vision statement, as I read into the record before, to uh, displace Premier with excellence and uh, use that as our new vision statement for Edina Parks and Recreation Department. Is there a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None? Okay, that passed. Thank you. Appreciate your comments and inputs. Next up is comprehensive plan, sixth iteration of our comprehensive plan. And I hope it keeps getting a little bit briefer and more concise, uh, but did want to share with you the, uh, the inputs and the changes that, uh, that we've made to this next iteration. So since we went through it our last time in April, I took inputs from our park uh, meeting in April. We had our planning commission review that I noted uh, on April 11th. Uh, we also received inputs from the Edina Community Health uh, Commission. And then we had a check-in, a halfway check-in on May 3rd that was hosted by the Planning Commission and the City Council. And so we were able to share some things and that comes up on our next agenda item as well. But uh, so this is our sixth iteration and I'm just gonna hit a couple of the highlights. Um, I tried to address some things and I'm just gonna hit those specifically that came up in our last meeting. Uh, let me make sure I've got the right ones for ourselves. So section A around parks, open spaces, and trails, we talked about uh, develop additional metrics, thinking about a view of the future. What will our park space needs be like? Um, aligning ourselves with some of the discussion and changes that are going on in the Southdale district and maybe closer ties uh, with that and we, with aligning ourselves with even some discussions around lids in the future. We don't have answers here yet, but it's attempting to reflect that we may to, need to look at additional things than just our 15% of Edina's land area to parkland and open space. So I think beyond this, we'll probably leave it up to some work with the staff. Ann and I know last time you said we had some other metrics that we could bring to play, but at least wanted to be a little bit more uh, reflective of the fact that we do have some things that are changing in the way we look at parks in the future. Okay. Comments, thoughts about that? Otherwise, I will keep moving right along. Uh, ta -ta -ta -ta. Let's see. Let's look at, uh, there are some just mentions of, again, the small area plans and, and bringing that into consideration. Section E was the next one that I think we'd had some discussion around in our meeting last month. Couple points on this. One was partnerships, and especially how Edina Park and Rec Department and this commission engages. Um, Two things. One was uh, kind of how we look at engaging outside of Edina for partnerships, specifically around uh, athletic field use. Uh, the input that we had last time was to draw back a little bit from implying that we are going to own it and drive it and to think more around 
welcoming uh, the input and, uh, and discussion and partnership with others and to be supportive of the efforts of our athletic associations as needed to explore creative solutions for access to additional field or court space. So the inputs that I heard from last month was let's not necessarily force ourselves to take a leadership position there, but continue to partner in what has been an ongoing and from what I heard last month, successful way of doing it. Okay. Um, and then the other one was point G, again still an E, which was the discussion that we had around transparency, accountability, sustainability of, um, of our assets through some kind of a, an annual or long range plan and reviewing the plan. And again, some of the inputs pulling back on that a little bit to recognize that that's really driven by staff and the city manager. Uh, but we did get some insight, at least what I heard, was we, we still think that's an area that it's good to have something, but to not be maybe as directive as it seemed before. So what we've got on that uh, point now is to ensure transparency, accountability, and sustainability of Edina assets. Edina uh, Park and Rec Department staff will commits to work with the city manager to renew long-term business plans for our enterprise facilities every third year. Annual reviews of performance against plan will be conducted by Edina Parks and Rec Department staff and the Park and Recreation Commission appropriate with the end of each enterprise facility season. So again, leaving that really to staff and city manager to determine what those plans look like. And from our perspective, from an oversight perspective, just saying each year we have some kind of a review of how the season go, which I think is a discussion we likely have anyway. Uh, Greg, I just, my concern with um, G is, and I don't know if you saw the presentation that they did at that dinner for yep. the commissions, yep. but um, on page seven it had specifically what is not a commission role. Commissions do not direct the, uh, the work of the city staff, which I don't know, kind of came across to me in G like it did a little bit, and they do not take responsibility for financial performance of any city facility or program. Yep. And when we use the word oversight and uh, performance versus plan, that's almost like us taking responsibility for are these facilities meeting their plans. And to me, specifically, she spoke to that that night and said no commission um, should be doing that. So I don't know if you've had discussions um, with the city manager or the assistant manager or whatever, but that, that concerns me based on what I heard that night. Yeah. Well, that's, that's fair input. And I think, again, where we're trying to go with this is, again, this is a document for the overall activities of the department and the commission in supporting it, right? So it's making a statement publicly that we think this is, we, we being the department and the commission thinks that this is a good management practice to have. What I've tried to take and change the wording here is it's the responsibility of the city manager and the department to put those plans together. And then at the end of each season, they're in essence just telling the commission, this is how the season went. Yeah, it's, it, it's that one part though in G where it says, um, that was particularly concerning. Um, the staff commits to work with the city manager to renew long-term business plans. It sounds like we're directing them to do that, which is exactly what this document says we shouldn't be doing. And this is the comp plan that is directing them to do that. That's not us as a commission, but it's the Dyna comp plan that's saying, we believe this is good policy. Oh, so this isn't, I thought this was our part of the comp plan though. Well, it is. We're right. the ones that are creating it, but just like any other policy in here, what it's saying is we believe this is good policy to have okay. for Edina Parks and Rec's department. But it is then pointing to the city manager to say, and it's your responsibility working with the department to execute that policy. So, so go ahead. Greg, do, it, are, do you have these meetings now or do you do this every third year? Now, because my concern is we're adding some sort of work or some process that's currently not in place, and I don't, I don't know that. We don't have any meeting that we have every third year right now. Right. We so, do annual, we do quarterly, you know, but we don't have an annual every third year business plan meeting currently. No. To do long range planning. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't to me, do that's it in kind that of a disconnect of if they don't do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we can we should be telling them to do that. Whether and, and, and that may be exactly the direction we go. My view, I guess, looking at this would be, is that okay? Is that something that we think we should have? 
as an advisory board and a city that we have all this money that's spent on our assets and do we do any kind of long range planning and then follow up on those plans as opposed to just annual plans? I guess in my view, that's for the city council to direct the city manager and the staff to do. That's, that's where I have really struggle with it. It's, that's not yeah. what we were set up to be, in my opinion. Um, and certainly from what it says, what our role was at, or is to be and not to be um, at that meeting. And she had a particular emphasis on that at that evening. So that's where I thought, you know, that's kind of overstepping, in my opinion, what we're set up to do. Yeah, I wonder, Greg, if <clears throat> this came out of, I think we've all had multiple discussions here and as we're after we're adjourned and stuff about how much transparency we have to say a budget process, you know, it's, it's a, it's a uh, CIP year and you know, how much can we help give ideas if that's the best place and, or be advisory in our role to say, Anne as she's prioritizing the 17 playgrounds or whatever it is on the list, like how can we help? I think um, it's just maybe a little bit more of a softer language um, here. Um, I think that they do have some long-term budgeting. It'd just be nice to find a way that we could actually have some just insight, maybe not oversight, but insight into those things, especially too for us as we're starting to go through, you know, like we look at our work plan and we know that there's this works on the, the docket. Some of this requires budget. Um, it'd be nice to have that maybe up front to know that some of these things are going to be really more about helping build some strategy, but there's not going to be any, any, as an example, say like Weber Woods, we'll use that as an example. Weber Woods project might just be more about building the strategy. It's not going to be necessarily committing anything to dollars and construction in this year because we know the budget's already gone. So um, while I like this, I just wonder if it's more of a, how do we build an, a, a way to have that communication or insight to us? If that makes, does that make sense? I, I think that that's a concern or comment that I've had in the past. So one, one thing I, I've kind of struggled with over the last several years is how we approve the fees. We have that process where we, we look at the fees for the mm -hmm. facilities, but we don't really know how that results in to kind of a, a budget or a profit or so, I, and I don't know, and we don't really have anything in, about that in here, but it, it is kind of a disconnect where why would we be responsible for looking at those if we're not responsible for anything from a financial perspective. So, and I don't know why, why we, how, how that <clears throat> resulted or what we hope to get from the, the fee review. And maybe there's something to incorporate as part of the fee review, there's a process to understand the, the impact and budget of the facilities. Be before you answer, I just want to say, I kind of agree with you. I don't know why we were looking at fees. I know nothing about fees or what they should be or, I mean, that's tied up. And we have a finance department here, you know, that oversees and looks, audits all this stuff. So, yeah, I honestly, when I saw that come out last year, I was just like, what do I know? <laughs> like, am I supposed to go run right around to all the other parks and look at the fees and are we in line? And But that goes with, you know, budgeting and costs and expenses at all these facilities. And that's got to roll up from, you know, what they need to cover that. Right. So I, yeah, I, I would be for one to say, leave that out as well. And I don't disagree with you. I completely understand and have been through, you know, the, the uh, fees process with commissions for the last many years. And I understand your frustration. It's something that it's always been the way things have been done in the city. That doesn't necessarily mean that that always has to continue. Um, it is by ordinance that the city council approves the uh, parks and recreation fees and charges as they do all of the fees and charges that are charged throughout the city. Um, but yeah, I, I totally agree. Just because it's always been done doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that it should always be done. And I understand the difficulty of not understanding the budgets and all the thought process that uh, they go behind all of the, the fees. And we do um, have a lot of internal audits between Susan and myself, city manager and finance department, um, that go into all of the fees and, and why and business plans and um, budgets. So um, might be a recommendation that you might want to make to the city council as well. And I just want to say, Matt, I totally understand what you're saying about sometimes it's frustrating to work on a project knowing that we don't have the money for it. But I don't see, I, I, there's a big disconnect for me there with 
oversight over facilities, budgets, expenses, and are they performing to plan? Um, I think there's probably been a lot of examples where we have to do the work first. It's like it's the sausage making of government at whatever level. And we have to do all those plans first and then go and get it approved and find, have, find the money. I mean, they, they've done it before and that's just the way it's done because we don't have a set budget for parks and commissions and, or a flow of income coming in that can be used for that. So I get your frustration, but I don't know that that's the answer for it. Yeah, and I don't know if it's the answer. I guess when I think of us as a collective group, I think of it more as a board of directors. So if you work for any corporation and they've got a board of directors, they, people already have the budgets already rolled up and they're looking for you to be more of an advisory role. If I look at what the definition of what we do is, it's an advisory commission. We're asked to put together motions or opinion and those types of things, and I totally get that. So you know, it might be more of a chicken or egg conversation at this point, but it's, to me, when we're asked to put together a recommendation on, say, Arden Park, they already have a preliminary budget. We've seen the preliminary budget. We saw tonight a budget that's been amended a little bit. Again, still all preliminary until we start putting these things out for bid. And sometimes th that stuff becomes a little bit more interesting or in helps inform when we're looking at the totality of all the work that the Park and Rec's Department is probably has on their plate or has assigned for 2018. So I guess that that's where I was kind of going. It didn't. I'm not saying that we have oversight or we have the ability to vote to change or have the vote to direct, um, but I think when, at least for me, when I'm thinking about making an informed decision or a formed opinion, it's nice to have a complete picture and sometimes there is that information out there or that information's already been thought out. So that's just kind of where I was going with that. Well, I, so, think that I think we're allowed, I'm sorry, Ben. I think we're allowed to ask for the information. It's the wording of like, we're an oversight committee. I think we are allowed to ask staff, you know, how is a, if you need it for something, which I'm not sure what we would need that kind of information for since it doesn't go into pay for other things that I know of. Um, but I think we can ask questions like that. It's the, the language of like, you know, this is the role we're going to take that, um, I think does not fit how we were directed as to what a commission does or doesn't do. So, I mean, we can go to the city council and ask them to change that, but. Right, we've, we've been pretty clear from the city council that our role is advisory and not any type of budget. But the one thing I do think we could, we can decide is do we want to continue to do those fees? And if so, there's, to me, it needs to be connected to something else to be able to make a recommendation on that. So if that's an ordinance that the city council has and they want us to be an advisor on the fees, there's there should be other information that's provided so that we're actually giving them good information and maybe factoring something around the, that process, Greg, is just what I was thinking on the plans around it or the budgets mm -hmm. would make sense because that is, that is obviously a, um, a task that the city council has given us and we've, and since I've been on the commission, we've been doing that every year. And I really do like <clears throat> having the, um, the uh, heads of each of the departments come up and we get a chance to, to talk to them and understand more about what they're seeing in the market. And so it's a pretty interesting discussion, I think. It's just not based, it's hard to base it on any information to know if we're making a good decision or recommendation. So that's, that's my thought. Good. So Thank one you. thing, if I, if I might add, and this is a little off topic for the comprehensive plan, but Susan and I have talked about this for several years, would it make more sense instead of having the fees and charges conversation is to have our enterprise facility general managers come in at the end of their season and just give a status update as to you know, how the season went, uh, what went well, what didn't go well, what they're planning for the next year or two years. That seems to me like it might be a more valuable conversation, more interesting, spark more conversation, spark more feedback than just a recommendation on fees and charges where you don't really understand the, uh, the information that's going in or coming out of that conversation. So just something to think yep. about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that would very much actually meet what the intent of this point is as well without sounding as much like oversight, which Eileen is is uh, is raising. So, good idea. All right, thanks, Eileen. Appreciate it. So that I'll, I'll still mark that as one point that we may uh, drop or significantly change. Any other inputs across the document? Anyone see anything else that is a, a gap or missing that we still need to address? I also included the other five points that. Uh, Rick and I were at the Midway meeting representing the, the Park Commission, and as part of that discussion on May 3rd, we were just asked to present 
three to five what we think are big ideas that are coming out of our comprehensive plan. Uh, and so these were the five that I presented at the time to just say, here are some things that we're talking about that could impact broadly across Edina if, if and when we're successful over the next 10 years in the comprehensive plan. Thanks, Greg. Okay, if nothing else, we will close this part of the discussion and move on to the next agenda item. Appreciate all your inputs and insight. Uh, work plan update. So some of these we can check off because we've done them already tonight. Uh, initiative number one, Arden Park Natural Resource Plan. We've had a nice update on that. Initiative number two, Weber Woods Master Plan. I think we're probably still on pause on that one. So Matt, uh, you are still on in? pause. <laughs> Matt's going to cover all the rest of them, it seems like. Um, initiative number three uh, is our utilization report. And so, Matt, you want to give us an update on sure. where we stand on that? Uh, yeah, we had a what was scheduled to be a 30-minute meeting that turned into a 60-minute phone call on April 13th. Um, Commissioner Good, myself, Commissioner Burke, and then Tiffany Bushland from the Parks and Rec Department were able to make it. And really, it was more about... Um, selfishly for me, it was to really understand what is currently in place between the school district and the Park and Recs Department when it comes to field usage. And for me, it was actually quite eye-opening to know that there is already, uh, I'll call it a semi-formal formalized process in place for when they do this stuff. Um, when it comes to using, say, a association wants to go to a school and use a field or vice versa if the high school is looking to try to get on a Braemar early for a baseball game or something to that effect. So there is some of that stuff in place. And I think what um, the takeaway for uh, Member Burke and uh, Tiffany from Parks Department was is to kind of find out where we're at with some of that stuff to be able to pull that together. Um, I know that Tiffany sent over some information this past week um, and I think really the next steps is, is then to kind of synthesize this and start to look and um, be able to kind of say all right so based off of what we're seeing here this is the current usage um, across I, I will use this in totality across all the park and recreation areas within the, the city of Edina um, that's inclusive of rinks gyms um, fields, those types of things, and it's agnostic of a park and recreation department managed field and a school field. The goal here, I think, really is, is to be able to then go back and have something that we have on paper to be able to go to any of the associations that are saying that they don't have field space or um, they need help trying to find those things, um, even though I know the associations are very much responsible for that. But we have the information that can go back to them to say, you know, you've signed up for these things, and if we want us to do an audit of said field, um, we know that the soccer club, as an example, was supposed to use Pamela Park, and they didn't. So then we can go back to them and say, you had the field space available. If you didn't use it, then we can't help you. And if then you're looking for alternative sources, then I don't, I don't know what to tell you. And also to say that you, know, you do have the ability through this work then to be able to reach out to Tiffany or if it's Val or someone else um, to find the schools as a, as a suitable replacement as opposed to having to go to another community or say like renting space from OLG or those types of things. So um, we're moving along with it. We've um, both um, Val and Tiffany provided some information, like I said, and now it's just being able to kind of, kind of put it together and build out what we've learned from that information, so. Good, thanks. Val, any updates from your end tonight? Just that Tiffany and I did meet. We had about a, another hour meeting and kind of tried to uh, determine what we thought would be really useful for you. Um, I have not sent my stuff in yet, but we were, and then just kind of reiterating what, some of the things that Matt said about um, clarifying for this group and others what the current process is. We, frankly, everybody wants to use the same fields at the same time, so there are quite a bit of open field space, but it's at the times that people don't want to mm -hmm. use it. And so that was something that we also kind of are gonna to try to highlight because that might be good information for groups that are starting to say there's, you know, here's, here's the times that you can really enter this system. Um, because we do have, um, we've increased our field space between both the city and the school fairly dramatically in the last five years sure. added, so. And I think too, I think the outcome of this as well is, is to not 
be the police of that how that hierarchy builds out. So as an example, I know the hockey association, the outdoor rink space typically is for the younger kids, right? And as they get older, you're more, the older kids are pretty much always indoors, right? We're not gonna give the hockey association directive on how to do that or soccer or softball or whoever that may be. That's up to them. It's really more about us being able to say, here's in totality what we know, here's in totality what is scheduled, and based off of that scheduling, this is what we see the usage at. Is it 80%? Is it 110%? It could be one of the other. My guess is it's somewhere closer to somewhere between 95 and 100%. And like I said, it's in the park and recreation system, not system, uh, available fields, not, like again, it's agnostic school, park and recreation department, but um, it's really more about informing and then building a process that people can then go into that system and find additional space if needed because of uh, cancellation or I know that probably golf, soccer, softball, all of them would tell you that this spring it would have been very helpful to be able to figure that out with the compressing of schedules when there's stuff that's closing and you know fields aren't in proper condition yet. So um, that's the type of thing to be able to, to help plan for too as well. So I think one more thing, and this may be something that comes back to this group, is Tiffany and I had a discussion about um, where's the place of sort of uh, equity amongst teams, gender equity, I mean, ac yeah. access to fields and space, because there are groups that would have it ever, or certain sports that would have every single space, every single moment. So is, that a, is, is there a role for that? And then how do our policies and processes or commissions sort of help? Because there's emerging sports that are coming on all the time. Mm. I mean, you know, you're, you ask the, uh, ultimate field hockey or um, frisbee people, they, it's a ginormous group, they can't find space. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you kind of balance the needs of, of all the different sports groups and is that our place? So that was just something that we noodled. Good, thank you both. Okay, going on, initiative number four was our city comprehensive plan chapter. We've covered that well tonight. And then initiative number five, an update on the John Philip Sousa band situation. Brendan, do you have anything sure, yeah. new for uh, us there? Don't have any big updates at the moment because uh, Commission, Commissioner Miller and I got in touch with Scott Neal's office and they got back to us and they're taking it to the, um, the Arts Commission first and they're gonna get back to us on that. And they have yet to do that at this point, so no big updates at the time, so we're still waiting on them as of now. Okay. Good, thank you. All right, that wraps up our update on that. So great, just a question, you know, I, I noticed today that, um, you know, the Braemar Master Plan, which we are actively working on, isn't one of our items. I was just wondering why, why we don't have that as a work plan item. That was actually on our work plan last year. And we did finish the Braemar Park Master Plan, which was technically what was on the plan last year. The master plan was finished. So that technically the item was finished. Okay. The council asked us to then prioritize the plan. So yeah, it's, okay. so it's, a, con it's a continuation, continuation. Yeah. of the work from last Correct. year. Yeah. Okay, but we've, we're kind of marked that we've checked that one off. Correct. Right, okay, yep. thank you. Good question. Next item on our uh, agenda is a follow-up really, it ties very closely to the work plan we just finished. Um, and because of the fact that Weber Woods is not getting started, we wanted to take a look. We've had a couple inputs about reaching back to an item that we had suggested that the city council decided not to have us work on this year. And that was around the idea of uh, exploring and creating ideas around alternative funding. So what we have in your packet for your consideration is an advisory communication that, uh, that we would send to the city council if it's approved tonight. And I'll just uh, read through it. It just has about four or, five, four or five points. It says additional work plan item, explore alternative funding models. And it's a letter uh, from me on behalf of the Dinah Parks and Recs Commission to the Dinah City Council. We are requesting the addition of previously requested park work plan item, namely exploring creative options to supplement city funding of park plans. The park would like to study long-term funding options for the Park and Recreations Department that would supplement the city's budgeting and CIP process. For example, professional fundraising, endowment fund, friends of the parks, corporate branding, etc. This initiative was included in the original work plan recommendation from the park 
It was excluded due to other priorities that the Council had for the final plan. Since the 2018 work plan was approved, activity on Weber Woods has been delayed and it appears unlikely that this initiative will get any action this year. Due to the delay in Weber Woods, we have an opportunity to revisit other initiatives of importance for the Park and Recreations Department. It is clear from work efforts the previous few years, Edina Park and Rec Strategic Plan, Fred Richards Master Plan, Braemar Master Plan, Arden Park Redesign, etc., that we have many strong initiatives that will require future funding. Recommendation. It's the recommendation of the park that we reinstate a 2018 work initiative to investigate possible alternative funding options to support future growth and development of Edina's parks, programs, and green spaces. And I believe the way the process is, w would work is that, uh, Anne, it would be up to uh, uh, city manager to decide how it's what kind of charge it is on here. I think uh, Scott actually makes that final decision, but to me it sounds like it would be likely a study and report type of uh, a charge, as opposed to any other action that's on here. Right. Okay. Thoughts, inputs on that? Yeah, I like Any? it. I think it's very well laid out, and I think it's a great idea, and um, especially with Weber going away for this year we have the time but it's alternatives that other cities use so we should in my opinion explore it so I support it any thoughts I'd ask for if there's a motion that we uh, accept this as an advisory letter that we send to the City Council motion Second. all in favor aye. aye aye any opposed none passed and I know this is something that Mike had on his uh, work plan before, so I would uh, expect that Commissioner Miller might be interested in jumping on this as well. Uh, I had a question about Weber Woods, just because I'm more curious. I saw in, recently in the paper that St. Louis Park is changing the way that they govern their city. Are you following me? It's like one of the few cities that's doing, and I don't know what this is. I just read it in the Sun Current. And I know that part of the reason why Weber Woods is delayed is because of St. Louis Park working through some of their things, and since we have to work in tandem with them. So will this further delay being that they're, and I don't, I don't know what the form of government is. It's some sort of community. I, I don't pretend to be a civics person when it comes to this stuff, but I'm just wondering if, if this is something that, um, as we look at, when we start looking at 2019 and stuff like that, that we just need to kind of park for a while and, and uh, going forward. I guess I can't say exactly, but I would certainly hope that this master planning project for Warble Woods wouldn't be delayed any further. It's already been delayed two years, um, so we will continue to push as a staff to have it done in 2019. Okay, thanks. All right, the last item we have under reports and recommendations is uh, to review and consider for action tonight uh, approving Edina's Goose Management Plan. Seeing as we, uh, we have no formal presentation on it, and can you give us any brief overview around, uh, around what we're looking at here tonight? The um, goose population in Edina is managed by the police department. For many years, it was managed by the Park Maintenance Division, uh, but I'm gonna say about five or six, maybe seven or eight years ago, now that I think about it, um, the uh, wildlife population in Edina has moved to the police department for management. And uh, the police department needs a DNR permit to be able to uh, manage geese in Edina, and the DNR would like some sort of a public review of the process as part of their permitting process. Um, it sounds to me like this is a new request for the DNR, um, but it is not a new process for the city. Um, this is the exact same goose management plan that the city has used for many, many years. Our current animal control officer has been with the city for 15 years, and he said he's been doing the exact same goose management plan for 15 years, and he knows it was done for many years the same way prior to that. So what I wanted to make sure that you are aware is this isn't something new in terms of a plan. It is just something new in terms of having 
planning and advisory commission review it and uh, rubber, rubber stamp it for the police department. The police department doesn't have an advisory commission, so they asked yeah, if you would do it. <laughs> so, so is it true that not even the coyotes will eat them? <laughs> so. So the only question, the only question I would have would be to the percentage of the human population that's sensitive to the treatment of animals. And I know that this is a, a, pro, a process that's been in place for many years. Does this account for a, for lack of a better term, non-lethal way of managing the geese? Or is this only, are we talking about a reduction of, of the geese population? strictly through no there is certainly a very significant deterrence um, that is used throughout the city as well um, just to try to get them not to land it's a constant problem um, not only in our open parks and green spaces but at facilities like Centennial Lakes at facilities like our golf course so we use a variety of techniques uh, by putting out fake coyotes, fake owls. Um, we've used dogs. We've had uh, actually a staff dog at one point that uh, chased geese off the golf course. So we use a variety of different techniques. And then my only other question then is, would this um, lead into other, for the police department, other, um, I guess, mitigation plans for as Eileen mentioned, coyotes, there's wild turkeys, um, or is this just the only thing that they're concentrated on? Because I know that the, if you talk to residents about those type of nu nuisances, that those are also things that are concerns. They have management plans as well, but apparently just for the DNR permit, they need the oversight of the geese. But they certainly have very specific plans for management of the other wildlife populations as well. Rick, did you have a question? Yeah, since I live inside that little box. <laughs> I noticed right that. East of the right. golf course. It's your box down there. I support wholeheartedly this program. <laughs> and we did see a coyote in our front yard also. So. Yeah, also. yeah, I did notice just kind of as an overview, um, at least as I read through it, the highlights were it, it, it is a lot, to, Matt, to your point around conducting egg and nest removal as necessary. We'd contract with an outside management firm if, uh, if for work on this and if removal of geese were, were, was indeed necessary, mostly in these uh, red boxed areas, uh, which is where we get the combination of water and uh, open green grass fields for the geese to feed on. Um, it, 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 the plan encourages citizens to report it because it seems to be driven by both a nuisance as well as citizen complaints. Uh, and the intent is to keep the bird count in designated areas or to conduct a bird count in designated areas on an annual basis and then maintain it at an acceptable level that kind of balances those, uh, those issues uh, around uh, uh, reduced droppings and reducing complaints. Okay, any other questions on it? Otherwise, can I entertain a motion to approve the uh, goose management plan as uh, presented to us tonight? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you, that passes. Okay, next up, uh, chair and member comments and city council updates. You have in front of you uh, highlights of uh, the city council updates from uh, April and May. Um, I would highlight on there the May 1st presentation uh, that John Gunyu gave from Three Rivers Park District. Uh, I thought it was very informative. I watched it online um, a couple nights ago. So I'd su suggest that they, each of the commission members find that and watch it online. I think we have a, a real opportunity to partner with Three Rivers Park District even more so than we are already. And he certainly was presenting that as an option to our city council as well and the things that they're doing. and the, the mission that they have and what they're trying to do throughout our region. So I found that to be very helpful and from this at least would highlight that as something worth taking a look at. Comments from commission members tonight? Um, I would just like to thank the uh, staff of the city, um, Park and Recreation, and also the uh, Watershed District 
who came out Saturday and spent a lot of time at Arden Park with the open house, have spent, especially the Watershed District, I mean, they spent a lot of time engaging with the citizens of Edina on that project, and I think the staff has also spent a lot of time and done a great job. And this is outside of their, you know, eight to five hours, so um, yep. they are to be commended for the commitment they made to this project. Agreed. Thanks, Eileen. I just wanted to know if the dome has come down, and if it did, how did it, how did it go? The dome is down. It came down in a day, and it went very well. The Braemar Field is open. Anyone else? Otherwise, the only other things I might have to note, and maybe Ann, I'm stealing a couple things that might be on your list, but I wanted to remind folks that on June 3rd, Sunday, June 3rd, we have the grand opening of the Nine Mile Creek Regional Trail that's at Fred Richards Park at uh, 10 a.m. So that will be held uh, before we get back together again. So it would certainly be nice if we have a good representation of folks out at that. Um, and let's see, the, the other thing I'd like us to think about, we talked about it a bit last year when we were putting on our work plan a communication and marketing uh, opportunity. It was not one of our work items, but we had some discussion around how do we become more present, especially during the summer when there are outdoor activities that are happening. And so we're about to kick off that season, uh, whether it's a Edina Art Fair, whether it's the Garden Council coming up, in fact, later this week, and they have their annual plant sale, are there things that we as a commission would want to be present at, uh, just so that it could be potentially a listening post, an opportunity for us to further engage with the community at some of these uh, activities and events that draw broadly across uh, Edina, so that we're there to represent uh, the Park and Rec Commission and the things that we've got going on, and field questions or be present with some information as we have it available. So for those that might have an interest in doing that, maybe we can circle back with Ann and others and staff to see if there's a way that we make, a, make ourselves a little bit more present throughout the community uh, during the summertime. So I remember last year, I think you were encouraging us to participate in the open streets potentially. Mm -hmm. So that could be an option. And then the other thing before we get to that is, um, we haven't talked about the Adopt a Park program recently, mm. so we should right. determine if we want to continue that where we would reach out to those um, residents who were working at the parks because it's probably starting to pick up now. Yep, good idea. Okay, Anne, turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I have a few updates for you today. Um, on May 19th, there will be an Armed Forces Day Veterans Memorial event at Utley Park at 10 a.m. The community gardens are open and full. The Courtney Field lighting project uh, started today, actually, and is anticipated to be completed on May 23rd. All of our athletic fields, with the uh, delay in the blizzard that we had late season, um, all of our athletic fields are open. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the Braemar Dome is down and Braemar Field is open. Adult softball started this week. We have 49 teams uh, in our adult softball league. Uh, we are, seems hard to believe, it's just starting the summer season. We're already working on our fall activities directory. Um, a couple of items for City Council tomorrow. As you know, we're going to be making a presentation to the City Council that you saw tonight for Arden Park. Uh, we also are very hopeful. I'm at about, uh, I'm going to say 90% that we will have the new restaurant at uh, Braemar Clubhouse on the agenda for approval uh, for the City Council tomorrow night. We are just finalizing the very final details of the lease agreement. So hopefully we can get that done and, uh, and ready to go for the City Council to approve tomorrow night. June 2nd, which is a Saturday, is our annual vehicle day. We coordinate that with Richfield Parks and Recreation and it's co-sponsored by Saltdale Mall. Uh, that will be on June 2nd from 10 until 12, a very, very popular event. Last Saturday um, at Edinburgh Park, we hosted a Barnyard Babies event. We had over 500 people show up, between <coughs> five and 600 people. So that was a, a very, very successful event with cows and chickens and goats and dogs and llamas and rabbits and pony rides. It was a great event. 
we received a $10,000 donation from the Edina Rotary uh, to install interactive musical instruments. And uh, Susan worked on that project. Uh, they will be installed at Roslyn Park. Uh, they're actually here, so we're looking forward to installing those. Uh, we had a great opportunity to promote one of our park maintenance team to a supervisor position. Any of you who have been involved in athletic associations probably know Brian Dristy. He is a field expert. Um, he has been promoted to a supervisor in the park maintenance division. And then lastly, this Thursday is the city spring cleanup day. So our entire park maintenance and public works divisions work together to spread out throughout the community and do a significant spring cleanup project. That's all I have to report. Good, thank you, Ann. Any last minute comments from anyone? If not, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.